uh, here in Amsterdam. I love it here, um, and I'm super happy to be here. I'm excited to talk with you all about the Epic stack. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something that you might not feel super comfortable doing, but it is good for you. So please, if you are physically able, please stand. Yeah, I know you just sat, but we're going to have you stand. <laughs> I want you to put your arms out in front of you like this. Don't touch anybody, but um, <laughs> and squat down like this and come back up. This is called exercise. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do 12 of these together. I want you to count out loud with me. Ready? One, two. You're doing so great. Three, four. Five, I'm having so much fun, let's start over. One, no, just kidding. Seven, eight, nine. You feel that blood is flowing now? This is good. What, I forgot where we're at. Three, no, just kidding. Stretch up over your head as high as you can and over to one side and over to the other. All right, you can sit down, thank you. That's good for your blood flow. Your brain needs this, this is good. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go from that exciting blood flowy uh, motion to a content warning. I'm told these actually don't work, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. This is sadness ahead. Uh, this is something that happened in Utah a couple months ago, uh, not far from where I live. Um, and it was this. I'll just tell you right from the get-go, nobody was hurt uh, in this event. They knew way before time that this was going to happen, um, but not far time enough because they ended up building a house here. So this is actually a pretty new home. They piled up a bunch of dirt against the edge of the cliff and then built a home on it. And one, of a, one and a half homes um, fell down. Um, we are all terrified of making this mistake. Maybe not this specific mistake. I, I don't know, any contractors here? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but making a mistake where the likelihood is really low Maybe not on the edge of a cliff, but the likelihood is low, but the, um, the impact is really high. So um, just as a kind of something I thought was um, maybe not ironic, but sad is the name of the company that built this house. <laughs> that is their tagline designed for life. Well, short life for that house. <laughs> so the modern Web development is just fantastic, right? We have just an enormous amount of tools available to us to build the best web application experiences possible. Can you imagine building the types of experiences our users expect 20 years ago with the, the tech of 20 years ago? No, there's no chance that we could have done what we do now with the tech of 20 years ago. So this is awesome, but it's a double-edged sword because it's also really exhausting. How many of you remember JavaScript fatigue from like 2014, 2015 time? Yeah, a couple of you, yeah. That, uh, that was a, a rough time and actually it still is pretty exhausting. You know what's really exhausting was putting this slide together. Those are a bunch of tools, but certainly not all of the tools that you use to build a web application these days. And of course, some of these you wouldn't use uh, together some of these are kind of competing products. The only time you could, uh, would ever use them together is if you're migrating from one to the other, but many of these you certainly would use uh, together. And so wiring all that together is that's a huge amount of work. And on top of that, knowing which of all these things to use, making those decisions, that is exhausting. Oh, wait, shoot, I just remembered. I missed one. Oh, there it is, yeah, there. <laughs> My favorite. But yes, even Elmo doesn't like this, uh, this picture. But this is the reality we live in. Here's, here's the real, like making it real though, it actually doesn't really matter which one of these things you choose. As much as we want it to, we want to say that our app is the snowflake, that is it, like, it has to be exactly these tools and there's like the perfect answer for this. No, you could literally blindfold yourself and throw a dart at this picture of logos and be probably fine. You could build just about anything with any of those pieces of technology. So it's fine, whatever you choose between these. But, uh, and, and we all know it, but it's really difficult to decide still, even though it, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. So on the one hand, that's probably fine. But on the other hand, we have to live with it for as long as we have the application, right? We would have to live with whatever decision we make. And if you just make a decision and then later on a year or two down the road, you decide, oh, we need to migrate. That was a bad decision. 
Now you've got to rebuild the house. Maybe not a rewrite, but migration feels like a pretty big investment. And so we're terrified of making the wrong decision when you have so many decisions to make that could lead to that sort of a situation. And so we're thinking about it constantly. How do we make the right decision? When again, it's really low likelihood that that sort of thing would happen. And then once you have made the decision, getting everybody aligned with what they're supposed to uh, be doing or the patterns we're following can be really challenging. Like, okay, we're doing it this way. And then this developer goes off and does it this way. And then this developer goes off and does it this way. And now you've got three ways to do the same thing. When I was at PayPal, we had three ways to do a combo box experience. We had three different implementations of the same component. I said, enough is enough. And that's where Downshift came from. Anybody here using Downshift? Anybody here heard of Downshift? Really? Oh, yeah. Hey, Evis, good to see you. Uh, so yes, getting everybody aligned is a, a huge challenge. And then wiring everything together. It doesn't always work exactly right the first time. And <laughs> Things don't turn out very well when you, uh, you're trying to wire these different tools together. That's a, a real pain as well. It all just becomes a big distraction to our ultimate goal, which is to engage, just to ship. It's just distracting us from our ultimate goal. So here's, here's the deal. I've been around for a while. I've shipped applications to millions of users with my time at PayPal and, and other companies as well. Uh, and then I've shipped applications to a couple of users. And of course, to myself, I've built applications for myself and everything in between. And so through all of that process, I've kind of developed some opinions and I feel like I have a pretty good handle of what to decide based on the, the options that are available to us. I kind of feel like, oh, I've seen this before. I know what to do and I will engage. <laughs> um, but not all these opinions are shared. Uh, some people don't like my opinions, and that's fine. You don't have to like my opinions to still be able to use them effectively. So I want to introduce something to you that I've been working on for a while now. It's an opinionated project starter and reference. It's called the Epic Stack. And it is, it is pretty big. It's, I, I might say epic. So let's talk about what it is. It's a project starter. So uh, it's a Remix stack. Eventually, there will probably be a custom CLI for it. But right now, the, the Remix CLI is pretty good at, uh, at generating this for us. Um, and then it's also a reference implementation. And this is where I think most of you to be um, most useful. Uh, it, uh, most of us aren't going to work every day starting new projects That's uh, unless you're building MVPs all the time, in which case you will love the Epic Stack. But it, it, most of us are building existing applications. We need to add new features or fix bugs or whatever. And so um, the Epic Stack is a reference implementation of a lot of different things that I'll show you here in a moment. Um, and it has great documentation, which we'll talk about more as well. As part of that documentation is decision documents. So uh, by virtue of the fact that this encodes a lot of opinions, I want to explain why I've made certain decisions in uh, this project starter. And so you can take a look at the decisions that I've made and my reasoning for why we're going with uh, service A or a pattern B or whatever. Um, that's a hat tip to the Remix team. They do this as well, and it's awesome. Um, they, they didn't invent it. I don't know who invented decision documents, but they're awesome. You should be using that in your own applications as well. It helps a ton. It's like journaling your decisions. Uh, it's very awesome. So before I get into the actual opinions themselves, I want to talk about the principles that guide the project. Um, and I, I will occasionally say we, um, but I'm really just saying me, because this, uh, uh, this is a benevolent, benevolent dictator situation. I make all the decisions, and that you will like that, I promise. Um, uh, design by committee is where projects go to die. So um, <laughs> guiding principles here. Principle number one, I want to limit services. Um, I am definitely on team monolith, and um, while having a, a microservices architecture can be really useful in many situations, I would argue that most situations, it actually adds way more complexity than it um, reduces. And so um, I don't mean just third-party services I want to limit, but I want to limit your own services. So the, the fewer number of services you have, the much simpler your application uh, deployment will go, the much simpler development will be. And so while I do want to make it so that you can add services as needed, I want to limit services, at, especially in the outset. 
Um, the, because it's a project starter, we need to include some code. I want to include only the most common use cases in that code so you have less stuff to delete um, if you're starting a new project. Um, but I need to have enough in there for it to be actually useful. So there, that's another one of the principles that guides the project. I want to minimize setup friction. So um, even though we are limiting services, I'm not running this app in like uh, a server in my closet or something. I do have services that we're using for deploying these apps um, and other services for doing production monitoring and stuff like that. So uh, I don't want to add a bunch of friction for getting started, though. So uh, we write things in a way that uh, will allow you to deploy without having to set things up right from the get go. Uh, and then optimizing for adaptability. So I believe firmly in my uh, opinions and the decisions that have been made here, but um, the, the idea is that the only thing that's consistent in software development is the fact that nothing's consistent <laughs> and that things are constantly changing. And so we need to be able to adapt to that change. I, I think that the tell of clean code in my mind is whether it can adapt to change. And so that is another important guiding principle of the stack as well. And then only one way to do it. We don't want to have that herd of cats that are going all different ways. So if, uh, if somebody approaches me and says, hey, I want to do things this way with the Epic stack, uh, if it conflicts with an, an existing way we're uh, doing things, then we'll either say, no, we're not going to do that at all, or we'll swap things out completely, because um, we don't want to have a, multiple ways to do the same thing. Uh, and then finally, offline development. This is very important to me. Um, I do like going up into the mountains and working offline, but that's not why this matters. Um, this matters because it means your tests will run faster and more reliably. It means that you can run faster and more reliably, um, metaphorically speaking. Uh, and, and so if the downstream services that you depend on are uh, down for some reason or not finished with development, you can continue to develop against uh, local mocks, which I think is very important. So those are the guiding principles of the Epic stack. Um, so I think about now you're probably wondering what are the opinions of the Epic stack? Because you're like, well, this sounds great, but if he's using Tailwind, by golly, there's no chance I'm gonna use this thing. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's, yeah, let, let's get you what these opinions are. Here is what the Epic stack looks like today. Uh, oh, whoops, spoiler alert. Um, so of course it's using Remix because it, in my experience, Remix is the best for the most number of applications. It is fabulous. In fact, I can't think of a single thing that I would build on the web that I wouldn't use Remix for. Um, also using React. I'm in a, a group of friends here, so that's safe to say that React is the best. It's awesome, I love it so much. Um, <laughs> And uh, certainly the best way to, to get a job in this industry as well. And it's just, it's enormous. Uh, you cannot refute that. Um, so uh, yeah, of course there. Uh, then we are using services. So fly.io is where we deploy. Fly is awesome. Um, so I know that serverless is like the hot thing. Everybody loves serverless. The, the problem with serverless architecture uh, or Lambda serverless function, everybody understands these terms differently, but like if we're talking about like a Vercel serverless function or Lambda or something, uh, the problem with that is serverless breeds services. So at some point you need to have some long running process somewhere, somebody needs to run that to do like background jobs and diff different things. If you're deploying on serverless, you don't have a long running process. And so you have to have some other um, service that will do that for you. And so now you start paying for a bunch of different services, which they love very much. Um, <laughs> and so I, I very much appreciate Fly, especially as you're just getting into it, because then you don't have to start setting up all these different services for every long running thing you need. So huge fan of Fly. Um, and um, uh, Fly is actually like a serverless for long running servers because I, you can deploy to many instances all over the world. And so like you don't lose out on any of those benefits. Uh, Fly also comes baked in with uh, Grafana support. So you have production monitoring, you have Sentry uh, support baked in now as well. Um, Fly deploys a Docker container. I know some of you probably started shaking in your boots when you saw the Docker icon. I know, I also don't like do working with Docker, but uh, the Docker file, pretty much you never touch. It's generated for you. Um, and uh, when you do need to modify it, you'll be glad that you could. Uh, so that is another aspect. And then of course, GitHub Actions, we can deploy to production, staging, and all of that. Resend is our email uh, provider. We're, we're using an e email service uh, for this, even though you technically can send an email straight from Node, um, because you need to use an email service if you want people to be able to get your emails. So. I hate it, but it is what it is. Um, 
using Express and Node.js, they're uh, great. Um, using, whoa, geez. Uh, using Tailwind, PostCSS, of course. Why would you use anything else? Tailwind's amazing. So um, also SQLite. This one might surprise some of you. SQLite is amazing. Raise your hand if you have more than a petabyte of data in your production database. Yeah, SQLite can hold a petabyte of data. You'll run out of hard disk space before you run out of uh, place, stuff you can stick in SQLite. And the fact is that SQLite, it's running on, uh, like on disk, so there's no network latency. This thing is nuts. You, you have like the uh, log n problem of, of the number of queries that like explode, and now you're making 300 queries or whatever um, all of a sudden. SQLite can handle that just fine. Um, that is not a problem. It's amazing. It's not a toy. It is like a legit database that I've been using in production for years, and it's awesome. Um, so then we're using Prisma as our ORM. Fantastic. Uh, this is all preloaded with um, permissions like uh, role-based access control permissions and, and all of the different things that you'd expect, like uh, user table, um, all of that stuff, uh, passwords, everything. Um, and then for forms, we get type-safe, progressively enhanced forms. You should be more impressed by that than you probably are, but it is fabulous to get type-safe, progressively enhanced forms using Zod and Conform. How many people here are using Zod? That is actually really cool because Zod is relatively newer and it's just so great. Uh, so you should definitely give Zod a look. It's fabulous. Uh, Shad CN and Radix. I was using Shad CN before. It was cool. Um, <laughs> now everybody wants to use it and it's awesome. Really, really great. Radix as well. Because uh, this is for, uh, sorry, back it up. This is for reusable components like, a com um, well, I was about to say combo box, but that's like the one thing they don't have yet. Um, but Shad CN does. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like date pictures, all, all of those complicated things that you need to have uh, be accessible or very difficult to make accessible. Uh, so yeah, that's awesome. And then of course, all the testing stuff. I, if, if you like the uh, testing library, library um, uh, you're welcome. I made that a couple of years ago and it's awesome. Uh, if you don't like it, um, I'm sorry, come talk to me later. I'll explain why you should. Um, um, but uh, yeah, also VTest and Playwright, Faker, MSW, really, really great tools. And then of course we're using TypeScript, like good grief. <laughs> it's 2023, folks. Get on the TypeScript train. Uh, and then ESLint, Prettier, of course. No, I'm not even gonna ask. Prettier is amazing. You should definitely be using Prettier. So that is it. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. I just listed these this morning. I'm probably missing stuff, but this is all baked into the Epic stack. When you generate a new Epic stack uh, project, you get all of this stuff. Now, the, the fact is that like lots of this is generated code that now you're responsible for, but how would it be to, like you, your decision is, do I use the Epic stack and get all of this stuff and then I can build on top of that? Or do I build all this stuff myself? Those are your options, you decide. Uh, and then we have also examples in uh, the repo. So not everything, like I, one of the guiding principles is to include the most common stuff, but we also have examples of different things that people want to use um, commonly. And so you can, yeah, please do contribute examples as well. There are a lot of different examples of people using the Epic stack. Uh, okay, and one thing that's unlikely is many ways to do the same thing. That'd be against our guiding principles. So if you don't like the opinions, then fork it. That's the cool thing about this, is that you can just make your own. So the Epic Stack is a GitHub repo. You can go there and star it right now. I know that star, stars are a vanity metric and you're not supposed to think that they're cool, but here's the thing. If you're looking at two projects and they are almost identical, you can't really decide between the two of them and one of them has two stars and one of them has 300 or 5,000 or 20,000, you come on, be honest, which one are you gonna choose? Right, so stars actually do matter. And uh, so yes, a star would be appreciated for sure. Uh, help is welcome, especially examples. So please make contributions. We're on discussions and also my Discord. We chat in there quite a bit about web development in general. Uh, and there's a channel for the Epic Stack. So I welcome you to join us there. Okay, so with the last couple of minutes, I just want to wrap up with um, a struggle that I had recently um, back in May. I had to update this slide because the icon in the corner. So uh, yeah, struggling with making decisions, um, it's pretty painful. I normally don't struggle making decisions. The struggle I was having was with this, whoops, just kidding, with this, epicweb.dev. This is the thing that I've been working on for the last year that has consumed all of my attention, trying to uh, come up with 
a way that I could teach you everything you need to know about building full stack web applications. And my struggle was that with, with testingjavascript.com, everybody knew if they were a customer. I need to learn testing. Boom, I'm a customer of testingjavascript.com. With Epic React, I need to learn React. Boom, I'm a customer of Epic React. With Epic Web, though, like, I'm a web developer. Like, are you a customer of Epic Web? I don't know. Like, maybe it's too beginner. or Maybe it's uh, about all these other things. But I, I'm, it's, it's just too broad. And so um, I realized that um, what, I, what Epic Web can do for you and do for all of us is help you avoid these kinds of feelings of analysis paralysis, where you feel like I'm going to be making the wrong choice. So Epic Web Dev doesn't teach everything that I know about web development, like I originally thought I would, was building. What it actually teaches is everything that I recommend for you to build uh, Epic Web Apps. There are a lot of things that I know that I wish I could forget <laughs> about building web apps. And so that is what Good grief. Uh, that is what the um, Epic Stack is. And Epic Web is basically the documentation for the Epic Stack. And so uh, in a couple weeks, I'm going to be launching the uh, first volume of workshops, self-paced workshops on Epic Web Dev that basically builds the Epic Stack. And so uh, even if you don't end up using the Epic Stack, the, it's all web-based stuff. And I just had part of the web authentication web workshop yesterday, and I heard time and time again from people, not, not a single one of them, OK, maybe one or two of them had used Remix before. This is all uh, using Remix, of course. And uh, I got feedback from a lot of them that even though I don't use Remix or any of the tools that you're using, I can apply this to my work tomorrow. Um, and so that's the really cool thing about the Epic Stack is that it's just an implementation of building an awesome web application with well thought opinions by a professional in the industry who's been through things uh, that uh, you can learn from. And so uh, while the self-paced workshop, yes, of course, that's going to be paid. How else do I feed my children? But um, there will be a lot of free material on there as well uh, to teach you everything that you need to know about building full stack web applications. And, and it's great. And it's all React, so I'm at the right conference. So the Epic Stack is about giving you a firm foundation. That's what I want to give to you. And I have one more thing. Is this how Steve Jobs feels? One more thing. This is it. Just one last thing for you. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you.